Welcome friends to another r slash malicious compliance video. Today we've got a great road rage story, but first a story from Priority. You can't perform creep by Radiohead due to spirit of the song. Our institution of about 2,000 staff had yearly dinner and dance events. This was pre-COVID of course. This was an educational institution where most of us are either teachers or administrators. I'm part of a small group of teachers and staff at this institution that formed our own staff rock band. We're usually given a 30 minute performance slot at previous dinners and dances, thus we were invited to perform again for the upcoming one. The theme for that year was superheroes. Our merry little band set out a full set list of songs which included songs like Holding Out for a Hero by Bonnie Tyler, the Shrek soundtrack version. We threw in Creep by Radiohead because we wanted a song to slow the pace down midway through our set. All of us in the band are music lovers covering multiple genres. And also coming from many different faiths and religions, none of us even considered that Creep was an inappropriate song on stage. So now let me introduce the antagonist of this story, I'll call him Ash. He was the main staff coordinator for the entire dinner and dance event. A role that was bestowed upon an up and coming staff who showed potential for leadership positions. Ash and his committee were the ones who came up with the superheroes theme and would oversee everything for the event, including our little 30 minute performance. Before this event, none of us in the staff knew Ash well, he was a bit of a loner. And as we would soon discover, he also takes his religion and values seriously. So seriously that he had no qualms claiming jurisdiction over the whole event with his values as constitution. We had given the committee our song set list two months before the event, after which we began rehearsing in earnest. No committee member said anything in those two months about any songs they wanted removed. At our last rehearsal before the event, Ash decided to drop into our rehearsal. Midway through our set, we began to play Creep, and he suddenly raised his hand to object and said, Stop, stop, stop! I'm removing this song from your set list. You can't play this song. We were stunned. This was two days before the show, and we had sunk in tens of hours of rehearsal by this point. Why? We asked. I read the lyrics of this song. The spirit of this song is offensive. It has the wrong values for an educational institution such as ours. We protested. Some of our band members were very religious themselves, and they saw no problem with the song, but he would not budge an inch. You are not playing Creep on stage. I'm going to escalate this to the deputy principal. The band members were fuming at this point, regardless of religion, but the band leader made the call. Okay, okay. You can't play the song on stage, right? Then we won't. And just to be sure, this is a superhero themed event, right? And your committee is encouraging all attendees to come dressed as superheroes. Am I correct? Yes, Ash replied and especially so for performers, so we're expecting your band to come dressed as superheroes to fit our theme. Cue malicious compliance. The day of the dinner and dance comes around, and over a thousand colleagues showed up, some dressed in Superman t-shirts, some as Wonder Woman, and even one in a full Deadpool costume, but none of them grabbed as much attention as one very tall, very leggy, very conspicuous Sailor Moon. Sailor Moon had on a tight fit sailor uniform, slim waist and generous bosom, extremely short skirt, and the wig. It was none other than the band leader, who is, by the way, a 40 year old male wearing a padded bra. Ash was livid, but as Sailor Moon was grabbing so much attention with so many folks clamoring to have photos taken with her, Ash didn't want to spoil his own party by telling her to take it off. At one point, even the deputy principal grabbed a photo with Sailor Moon. The 30 minute performance was decent, mistakes here and there, but none of us were professionals and the crowd enjoyed it anyway. Sailor Moon, who was the bassist, was head banging and swinging her wig wildly to the finale, holding out for a hero, ensuring that everyone had their eyes on her. Naturally there would be a best dressed segment, and it was clear from the start that Sailor Moon was going to be nominated and then destroy the competition, but Sailor Moon did something none of us expected. As the malicious compliance for the event, asking her why she chose to come as Sailor Moon, and the entire event hall was riveted on her, curious to hear her answer, she did not answer but instead started to sing, But I'm a creep. I'm a weirdo. What the heck am I doing here? I don't belong here. 
The crowd cheered and applauded, but no other table at the event was as overjoyed as the staff band table, who understood the deeper meaning behind what the band leader just did. It's been a few years since that event, and we aren't sure if Ash got that promotion he was seeking. He was such a loner that nobody really saw him much, thus nobody talked about him either. The band leader, on the other hand, became a legend. He was once at a meeting where the folks across from him said that he looked very familiar, like they'd seen him somewhere before. Then someone suddenly burst out, You're Sailor Moon! You're that Sailor Moon! They didn't even know his name. I think it goes without saying that they were kind of being a pearl clutcher with this song. Maybe Ash was projecting because the lyrics talked about being a loner, essentially. Do you think considering this song kind of touches on loneliness, that Ash was actually objecting just because it hits them a little too hard? Let me know what you guys think down in the comments. Our next story is from Mikey Bonbon 1988, The Big Guy and the Bigger Bouncer. Back about 13 or 14 years ago, I was working as a bouncer at a strip club in a rough area of Toronto, Queen and Jarvis area for my fellow Torontonians. Now the job was a well-paying gig, especially for a university student. My size gave me an advantage and it was better paying than a McJerk's job. Now as I said, I'm a big guy, but the other bouncer, Dale, my god, he was huge. I'm 6 foot 3 with a big build, but that man was at least 6 foot 10. His arms were my legs, the epitome of a huge witch. It was a Saturday night, and a group of five or six people started making trouble. Dale and I were on floor duty, and in the club, we always work in pairs. I went over to the table to give them a warning that it's time to settle down or get the freak out from there. It just escalated into them saying like, freak ain't no way they're doing crap. Mixed with booze and a ballsy attitude in the high testosterone environment, one of the guys had to be a big man and cause some crap. Now at this point, I wasn't conscious for what exactly went down, but one of the bigger guys around my size cracked me in the head with a beer bottle and I went down. Now Dale being the rough son of a witch that he was, saw this happen and he rushed over. Now I don't know exactly what took place in the time I was on the floor till I came to, but when I did, I stood up to the troublemakers, screaming, let him go, let him go, you're killing him, you're killing him. So Dale had the guy who cracked me in the head and the judo hold one arm in the air, both arms locked around his neck, tightening the hold and then releasing so he could breathe. Tightening and releasing, the guy's face is going purple, then back to normal. Purple, back to normal. Purple, back to normal. Now at this point, they're screaming, please, please just throw him down. The bar staff had already called the cops, but Dale thought it was enough that it was time to give them what they wanted. Again, Dale was a big freaker. Dale did exactly what they wanted to, to the letter. The man let him out of the hold, but grabbed him by the shirt, lift the freaker up, and threw the man at his craphead buddies. Dale pointed at them and said, You jerks aren't going to move, do you understand me? Looked over at me and said, Hey little Mikey, you good? The cops came and the one craphead got booked. But yeah, Dale was and still is a huge witch. You see, usually the term huge witch is used in a negative way. But this time it seems like it was a overwhelmingly positive one, at least as far as saving OP's rear end. All I know is, is it sounds like it's a great thing to be on the good side of a 6 foot 10 behemoth. By the way, if you're enjoying these stories, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. Our next story is from Subject Ad, complying with a resignation request. Recently our OG manager, who was fantastic, just left. One of the biggest things he did for our team was to keep the higher-ups from meddling in our day-to-day -day lives. As long as we hit our targets, we could pretty much do as we please. Want to work from home four days a week? No stress. Want to go out on the road and meet clients face-to-face -face instead of meeting over Zoom and phone? Be his guest. Feel like closing all of your deals at 2am every night and not logging on till 3pm the next day? Why not? Basically, do whatever, let him know, and hit the targets. It was all cool by him. You get the drift. Because of this, our team works our butts off and constantly hits targets, with myself and a few others doing so well that we recently got promoted. Personally, I got the 2IC job to work with a new manager, show him the ropes, train the new staff, etc. 
However, OG manager leaves as he can't take the stress from the higher ups breathing down his neck about his management style. Even though we constantly make and exceed targets, they're unhappy as he's not doing it through their formula. About a week or so after OG manager leaves, the new manager and pretty much another sales team are hired. New manager is essentially just a yes man for the higher ups. Our super awesome workspace goes downhill. We're required to be in the office 5 days a week 9 to 5, given a set seating plan and spend our time cold calling, not relationship building. We do this for a few weeks. The older reps who worked for our OG manager aren't having the best time. As not only are we now dealing with this shocking environment, plus we have to train new staff and the new manager on the systems, the product, meaning we really have no time to sell. Then we have a meeting. The new manager starts going on about the importance of the new system as it'll increase sales, which in turn will increase our commission. Now we get to the good part. The head office lady came down for this meeting. She doesn't have much day to day in the sales stuff. She's quiet until the end when she pipes up saying how this company has room for growth, is willing to promote internally, uses me, and points out me and some of the older sales reps as examples. She then goes on to ask for the resignation of anyone who doesn't believe her way will work by 5 p.m. the next day. Me and the other sales reps who were with the OG manager simply comply with her request and hand our notice periods in at the end of the next day leaving the company with a sales team that consists of a manager that doesn't know anything about the product or role, and a totally fresh team of newbie starters who have no idea what they're doing who will not get anywhere near the target for a long time. Honestly, I just feel bad for anybody that was working there with the OG manager that had to cross over into the new manager, or even OP who got promoted and no longer could work in that kind of environment. It's clear that this job was made absolutely special and perfect by that OG manager. And to me, it's kind of mind boggling that somebody could run things so well and hit every metric and they're still never happy. But I guess that shows you how stubborn and stuck in their ways the bureaucratic process can be. Our final story of the day is also from Mikey Bonbon 1988, the little man's road rage and my compliance. I had this encounter today, what led me into getting a tiny bit of malicious compliance in. Firstly, I have to let you know that I'm not a car guy, I've never been a car guy, and never will be a car guy. All my car is to me is something to get me from point A to point B. Ask me what car I drive? I'll tell you a black one. I drive a small Kia. At this moment, I'm not in my hometown, I'm actually at Niagara Falls, Ontario, and it was mid-afternoon so I was getting hungry. I decided to take a drive around to find something to eat. Out of nowhere, this large truck cuts right in front of me without signaling. It scared the heck out of me, so I honked. I guess it pissed the guy off because he took off and slammed on his brakes right where the two lanes merged into one. Like, this was road rage at its finest. The driver actually got out of his truck, walked to the back of it, and just started screaming at me, saying to get out of the car, just flipping out. Oh, he was a little guy. It's always the short guys. Now, I get it. He figured he was going to win. I look like a little guy when I'm in my car. It's a small car. But this guy is blocking the road, just swearing and yelling at me to get out of the car, generally trying to antagonize me. So, I said, screw it. Give the little guy what he wants. Now, did I say I'm not a little guy? To be completely honest, I'm a hulking brute. The second my size 13 shoes hit the asphalt, you could see in his face that he had made a mistake. Once I stood, his face went white, and all I did was look at him dead in the eyes and said, Yes, can I help you? Never have I ever seen a man nope out of a situation faster than that. Without saying another word, with the absolute look of defeat on his face, eyes as wide as a canyon, he's definitely blocked to the front of his car got in without saying a single word, and left. And all I did was give him what he wanted. I get out of my car. And I was always working under the assumption that Canadians were nice. Honestly, having seen enough of the news lately and some not-so-pleasant subreddits, whenever I hear stories of road rage, I think about myself in that situation, and I feel resigned to just, like, wanting to try and placate whoever it was and apologize and, you know, try to de-escalate everything because... 
Because God forbid, I've seen some crazy stuff go down in road rage situations that, like as easy as it is to act out and kind of enrage the other person further, it's just not really worth it. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now if you want to hear another compliance story that was crazier than any of the ones in this video, click on that left video. Or if you missed my latest video, check out the one on the right. That said though, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.